morning, everybody. Let's just bow our heads in prayer before let's start this, please. Lord, we just commit our time to you now, Lord. Lord, as we look at your word, as we just ponder on a few things, Lord, and we just ask you to draw near to us, open our hearts, Lord. Lord, we depend on you for everything. So, Lord, we do just commit this time to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to read a few verses, and I just, to start with, it's from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, probably 6, 5 and 6, Revelation 1, 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. And bless his holy word to us. The last time I spoke here, it was on the theme of my time is in his hands. And today I wanted to look at the theme, so to speak, the love of the Lord Jesus. And let's just be mindful before we start. This is only one side to the Lord, one facet. He's holy, he's just, he will judge, and he cannot tolerate sin, among other things. But you know, what amazes me is that he loves me. It was just, as I was doing this, there this last week or so, kind of running over it, and had it in my mind about this, or well, I think the Lord put it in my mind. I don't have much going on between the two ears a lot of the time, but I depend on him alone. You know, we're really only scratching the surface. And as I got into this, I realized how deep, how wide, how big this subject is. So that's all we're doing this morning, just basically scratching it. And when we look at the many facets of God, he's eternal, he's sovereign, he's immutable, which is unchangeable. I had to look that one up. He's holy. And coming back to love again, there's different kinds of love, as we all know. There's a husband for a wife, wife for a husband, kids for their parents, parents for their kids. There's all sorts of love. I love coffee, but that's neither here nor there. But it's love. But you know, there's his love then. If you know him as Savior, there's his love. And he's set his love in you. If you're here this morning and you know him as your Savior, he has set his love in you. And again, when I consider his love towards me, when I look back in my life and just think about things, and it did make me, make me think how blessed I am, how good he was to me, before I even knew him, before I was even born, he set his love on me. And you know, I'm sure that if you know him, you can say the same thing. I'm just hoping that this will convict us and challenge us. As we look at a few verses, We've read Revelation 1 5, and there's a few others there that I wanted to look at as well. And you know, it speaks here in Revelation 1 5, he's the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, which is important. Unto him that loved us and washed us in his own blood from our sin. There is love for you. He loved us and washed us in his blood. And this love that I'm talking about here this morning, it's a thing called agape love or agape. Uh, I listened to the pronunciation of it there the other day, but I, I don't know what I'm pronouncing it, but it doesn't seem to be right, but you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, this is love beyond our comprehension. This is different from other types of love. This is not, not a husband to wife for kids to parents love. This is a different love, totally beyond our, our understanding, to, I suppose. You know, the agape love is goodwill, benevolence, and willful delight in the object of the love. And that's his love for mankind. That's his love for you and me. And you know, I just, I copied and pasted a few bits here just 
to give an explanation of that agape love or agape or whatever it is. You know, unlike our English word love, agape is not used in the New Testament to refer to romantic or sexual love, nor does it refer to close friendship or brotherly love, for which the Greek word philia is used. Agape love involves faithfulness, commitment, and an act of the will. And it just, uh, you know, when I saw that, I was just thinking, John Owen said last week there about a wife being subject to her husband. She chooses to be. There's a choice in that. It is distinguished from other types of love by its lofty moral nature and strong character. Agape love is beautifully described in 1 Corinthians 13. I encourage you to have a look at that today. It's very short. I, I think it's only seven or eight verses. If it's even that, I just read it there the other day. And it's fairly on the ball, like the word of God is. In the vast majority of instances in the New Testament, it carries distinct meaning. Agape is almost always used to describe the love that is of and from God, whose very nature is love itself. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You know, God does not merely love, he is love. But you know, there's a warning in that as well for people. He that loves not, knoweth not God. Do we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we know the love that God has for us? Everything God does flows from his love. Agape is also used to describe our love for God. In Luke 10, 27, and again, you probably could quote it to me, Jesus was speaking with an expert of the law. And the expert of the law quoted this, but he was quoting from Deuteronomy 6, 5, really, when you, when you look back. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. And I just thought, who can do this? How can you actually do this? And it's not through our strength we do it. It's through the Lord's strength. Again, those of us that know him as our saviour, we know this. We're weak. We're not able to do things. But through him we can do it. Down a bit further, there's a few verses dealing with that weakness, the weak vessels that we look at as well. Do we love him like we should? Was another question in my mind. And again, I was, this is at myself, but I'm just trying it out there. Do we love him like we should? After all he's done for us? God's Zachary love is unmerited, gracious and constantly seeking the benefit of the ones he loves. The Bible says we are the undeserving recipients of his lavish love. In 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. And you know, that behold tells us to <coughs> stop, take notice, take a look at this. And the bestowed is the free gift. He has bestowed the free gift on us of salvation. Are you sitting here this morning having received that free gift? Are you waiting to get it? Or do you want it? Because it is a free gift. You know, he died for each one of us individually. God's demonstration of love led to the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus, for those he loved. Put your name in there. He died for Andrew. If you want to put your name in there, if you know him as your saviour, Put, some, put me in mind of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. But you know, just to finish that off, because sometimes people will quote God as love and we're all God's children. That's not biblically, biblically correct. Because in chapter John three eighteen there's a warning. Whoever believes in him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. If you don't believe in him, you will not have everlasting life. If you don't come to Jesus, there's only one place for you. You're bound for hell. And you'll spend an eternity there in suffering, which is a very unpleasant thought. This type of love is found in 1 John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we love the God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation, it's appeasement, sacrifice, his blood spilt for us, a shield. I believe that the things that they sent up there to, oh, I forget, these shuttles that they sent up to them, wherever they were going, they had a propitiation. Uh, pro- what is it, propitiatory shield or something like that to turn away the burning that you get when you come into the atmosphere. If you look it up, it's it's quite interesting, that word. John fifteen thirteen speaks of his love. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And he calls us friends if we know him as our saviour if we bow the knee to Jesus, if we've been saved by him. You know, he owes us nothing, and yet he done all this for us. You know, his love was so great that there's an empty cross and an empty tomb. That's how far he went for you and me. In 1 John 3.16 it tells us, By this we know and have come on to understand the depth and essence of his precious love, that he willingly lay down his life for us because he loved us and we ought to lay down our lives for the believers. The Lord Jesus said that you will know them by their love for one another. Do we love one another in Christ? You know, being human beings, not everybody do we like, nor does everybody like us, even among the brethren. Personally, myself, there's myself and another guy, we don't get on that well. We have different views of things, scripture things and all that, but we're both saved. And I love him as my brother. And I'm sure he loves me as his brother. And we're going to be great friends when we get to heaven. But we just, there's things that we don't agree with one another on this side. But we have a love for one another, a concern for one another. That's that brotherly love. You will know them by their love. You know, it's this precious blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We take on his righteousness when we're saved. This love that Jesus has for us is not in the past tense. Even though he died 2,000 years ago, it's still going today. His love is never ending, we're told that. And when we are saved, the Lord says to us, I just wanted to quote Hosea, actually, because just to come back to that, actually, I started reading Hosea about a week or 10 days ago. And it just struck me as I started reading the way that this Hosea tied in with the subject of love. You know, in the book of Hosea, God's love for mankind is mirrored by the actions of Hosea as a godlike example and his unlovable wife, Gomer, She was a tough case, she was a bit of a sinner to say the least, and she was representing Israel. But you know, I think we can apply to us. She epitomizes sin, but he bought her back. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus has done for us? He's bought us back. It's a very interesting read. You know, we're bought with the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we're like, we're like Hosea's wife, we're adulterers in the sight of the Lord, chasing after all the foolishness and sin that we can basically a slave to our sin, and that's what I was before I was saved. I didn't know anything else. I was just chasing whatever in front of me, drugs, whether it's sex, drugs and rock and roll kind of thing. I mean, that's what we do. But when the Lord breaks into your life, there's 180. You realise the difference? I look at it now and I think, oh my goodness, what was I doing? But I'm looking at it from the eyes of having been saved. She was a slave bought back and so are we that know Jesus is our saviour. 
If you don't own as your savior, you're like her, like Omri, you're filthy in your sin and bound for hell. And we need to be, even though I'm speaking about the love of God, we need to have a fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, we're told in the word. And I heard of two cases, funnily enough, this week. There was a pastor and he was talking about two men that had been saved in his church. They were obviously coming for a long time and they were sitting in the pew every Sunday. But lo and behold, the fear of God fell on them. They got frightened and they turned to the Lord. They were afraid of dying and going to hell. The Lord put it in their hearts, no doubt. And then there was another case. He's a man in his seventies now, but as a little boy, he went down to the basement one day and his father was looking for him. His father was a Christian man. He went down and the young lad was looking down and father said to him, what's wrong? And the young fellow pointed down and he said his father must have been given an insight by the Holy Spirit. He says, are you afraid of going to hell? And the young lad nodded, yeah. He was saved. He's gone on to share the gospel all over the place. He's been in Ireland actually, funnily enough, I didn't realise that. He's been here, there and yonder sharing the word of God. It was the fear of God, the beginning of wisdom, even for a little, little lad, I don't know what age he was, five or six maybe, primary school age. But in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Again, this is our Lord Jesus. This is the love that we're dealing with. In 1 John 3.16 it says, By this we know and have come to understand the depths and essence of his precious love that he willingly, and again this is paraphrasing, I have it in in, in inverted commas here, he willingly laid down his life for us because he loved us and we ought to lay down our lives for the believers. Again Jesus said you'd know them by their love. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 speaks of his love for us. If you read the first two chapters of Genesis, this whole thing was put in place for us. Everything was created. Adam was put in the garden, Eve was created. They were given all that beauty and that gift to look after. It was provided for us. And you know what happened with Adam and Eve, obviously. Adam and Eve messed up and the Lord in his goodness and mercy put a thing in place for to redeem them from that sin, which was the Lord Jesus Christ coming to Calvary. Deuteronomy 7, 7 says here that the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. Again, speaking of Israel, but we can apply that to ourselves. We are weak vessels. You know, sometimes when we're feeling well and things are going reasonably right and all that, we kind of <coughs> we can do anything. We're nearly mini supermen. But we're not, we're weak. We don't get out of the bed in the morning without the Lord say so. We're not here this morning without the Lord allowing us to be here. He has blessed us with that. In John fifteen nine to twenty. John 15, 9 to 20. I was just going to look at a couple of things as we go down through it. There's 10 verses here, but in verse 9, so I have loved you, he says. In verse 11, he speaks about the joy, my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. And you know, I think Brian was saying there earlier about going through things and family issues and health and all this, but we have a joy. When we know the Lord, we have a joy deep down. Now it might be shown on our face because you know, kind of I'm dying here. But the plain fact is we have a joy in our hearts. You know, I was listening to a chat last night, just for a few minutes, it was an update. The man has been diagnosed with uh is it Hodgkin's lymphoma stage four, I think. Reasonably sure I'm right in that. But he saved. And you know, he said, 
Basically, he said his time is in the Lord's hand and he trusts in him. And you know, it's refreshing to hear that. This man knows the Lord. He said, it doesn't matter what happens. He'll go to be with the Lord one way or the other. He'd like to be cured and continue on. And he, he does a bit of an evangelical work around. He's actually Scottish living in Kansas. But yeah, he said, the Lord's will be done. And he's trusting in him. Whether he's healed, whatever. He's going for treatment this coming week. But I just thought, yeah, I actually just come to back and praise the Lord for his, his witness. And it's encouraging to see that. That someone that's not well can say that. But that's someone that knows the Lord. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know the Lord, can you say that? I don't believe you have any real joy. You have no real happiness because you're chasing, literally, you're chasing yourself around the place looking for it. And you won't get it in money. You won't get it in family. You won't get it in cars. You won't get it in drugs, drink, you name it. You won't get it. The only place that you will find that joy and happiness is in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. I'm sure I see where I work, people are searching for all sorts. Or sorry, they're searching for happiness and all this. We're big into Eastern mysticism these days and yoga and the feel good factor and be positive. And I'm trying to figure out being positive and not to do anything. None of this is. You try to tell them about Jesus and they're just not interested. But then again, this stuff demands nothing of them. The Lord Jesus demands a response. And while this other stuff, if it was airy fairy, it wouldn't be too bad, but unfortunately these people don't realize who they're messing with. This is all devil inspired stuff. It's false gods, you name it. Uh, I got into this with someone a few years ago, who was speaking <coughs> about yoga, and I went away and I done a bit of research and the whole thing, and I came back and said, you're actually worshiping gods when you do those moves all these false gods and eastern gods, whatever they are, and they're not gods, but it's the devil is behind this. But suffice to say, we haven't discussed that matter again. That lady just had no interest in talking about it anymore, although to be fair, she did admit that those moves, yeah, she could see what I, what I was saying. And I think she understood maybe a little more than what I gave her credit for at the time. You will only find true happiness permanent happiness in the Lord Jesus. And it doesn't change what we have to go through. As I said, that poor man that's got that cancer now, he used to go through that. He used to go through treatment. Again, in verse 12 of John 15, 9 to 20, this is my commandment that you, love, that you love one another as I have loved you. Again, that's how they will know who we are. We love one another. He speaks in verse 14, he calls us friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. Verse 16, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. He has chosen us, lads. Again, verse 17 tells us that we love one another. And again, verse 19, he says, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Or you could say the world doesn't understand you, but it's actually deeper than not understanding. It is hate. I've seen that in action as well over biblical verses and quoting the word of God with people. It does not go down too well with some folks. Some people it's like water of a duck's back, more people just get very upset. That's his love for you. He chose you out of the world. I'm just standing here before you this morning and I know well I'd be dead or in the gutter if he hadn't chosen me out of the world. I'm sure you can probably say something similar when he broke into your life and saved you, literally saved you from yourself, from all the world, from the whole thing. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. And I was reading that, I just thought, who is the enemy to us today? It's sin. It's all around us. As followers of Jesus, do you know what amazes me? I have a Facebook account and you be looking thing looking at things, mixing stuff pops up that you don't need to see. And it's trying to draw you in. I've noticed that because I have a particular weakness, 
that I'm prone to. That's what comes up every time. They don't call the devil the lord of the air for nothing because that's where that internet is. It's back and forth in the air. I remember thinking about that years back and suddenly realizing, yeah, that's what that means. Be careful. If you know the Lord Jesus, be careful what you read, what you look at. And I'm saying this to myself. Be very, very careful what you listen to. I like music. But you have to be careful of that too. Because sometimes when you just stop and listen to words of a song, you think, oh my goodness. Have I lost the plot listening to this garbage? I left all that behind me. And that's where it should be. Hosea 2.23 says, I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that has not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. He has had mercy on those of us that were not looking for mercy. I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. I'm a Gentile, if you look at the word of God. And the Lord broke into my life and saved me. And I always find that great that I've been brought into the family of God. I've been adopted as a Gentile. Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. It's quoted in Romans chapter 9 there as well. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. That's us, lads. Children of the living God. If we know him as our Saviour. How blessed we are this morning. And that's, that's the love. Psalm 89, 36 and 37. Here's a promise for us. If we know him as our Redeemer, his seed shall endure forever. We're a seed of the Lord Jesus. He's the firstborn of many. And we've been born again down the road to be, I'll be 2,000 years later. We're still part of that family. We're still part of him. We're his brothers and sisters and friends because his word tells us that. His seed shall endure forever. And going on then to John three eleven. What are we to do? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. We are called to testify to people. There's many ways of doing it. Not everybody can go up in the street corner and do it with a microphone. You can do it in your workplace. You can do it in the shop, in the restaurant, the garage. All kinds of different places to testify to the Lord. You can do it with your lives. Noreen retired there recently and I can't remember the exact word, but the girls saw a difference in her. I'd like if they could say that about me, but I'm not as nice as my wife. I'm more pr- prickly and sometimes out of my mouth when I should shut it. And I shut it when I should open it. But yeah, they had that impression that she was a godly woman. That's really what it was about. But actually I must just came into my head there. A funny thing happened during the week in school. I was coming in the door and there was one of the staff and a child coming out the door. And they said hello to me. And the young lad, I don't know what he said. Because I said, what? And he said it again and I couldn't understand him. So I said to the staff member, I said, what's he saying? And she said, he's saying, hello, Andrew, follower of Jesus. And I was looking. I thought, what? Where did he get that from? And she repeated it a second time. I was kind of like, where did this child come up with this? Anyway, I walked in the door, and lo and behold, something happened. Someone said something to me inside, and literally it was chewing my teeth. But you know, I texted Noreen, and she said, the Lord is trying me out there. Because I was so blessed to hear that little fella call me a follower of Jesus, and... To be fair, I did say, I do my best to follow him. <laughs> Don't always hit the mark, but the Lord is merciful. He draws us on. 
despite her failings and her fallings. And again, keep short sim lists, lad, because Doug Burns often said that there. Keep the sim list short. Repent fairly rapid. But uh, later I spoke to that staff member and she told me she has no idea where this child came up with this. He said it several times to her. And they, he'd see me in the distance or whatever. I don't know what is going on. But you know what? We need to be a witness. Just by the way we live our lives. The way we operate with people. And I, I, look, hand in heart, lads, I find it difficult. I'm grand if I'm in a room on my own. Or out in a 2,000 acre field on my own. I'm grand. So I have to deal with people that the problems occur. I'm not a fierce people person. But by the grace of God, he'll knock them edges off me and draw me into himself and make me a better a better Andrew follower of Jesus next week than I was last week. But it's just mindful, isn't it? What people think and hear and see and oh it's scary. We're a witness. And it says here we're called to be a witness and testify. And what in John three thirty two, what he has seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receives his testimony. Again, it speaks about testifying. John 8, 14 to 16, Jesus answered and said unto them, Do I bear a record of myself? Yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone. But I and the Father that sent me. They are one. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. The Lord Jesus knows our heart. He knows us intimately. He loves us. He died in Calvary for whosoever calls on his name. Our final verse here then is John eighteen thirty seven. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And the question popped into my head. Do you hear this voice this morning? Is he speaking to you this morning? Are you sitting here not knowing the Lord is your saviour? Are you dead in your sin, totally wrapped up in whatever you're doing, your business, your, your job, your family, the world? He's speaking to you this morning. That's why you're here this morning. The Lord in his mercy has brought you in here this morning to hear his word. Not, not what I say. It's his word. That's where the truth is. I can say anything. But the word of God is true. Are you sitting here this morning wrapped up in yourself and in your sin? I know there was a time when I was. I had not him for anything else other than basically self-gratification any way I could. That's no longer the case. I just ask you this morning to consider the Lord Jesus if you don't know him. You have no guarantee. I say say this every time. You have no guarantee you'll see that car park. You have no guarantee you'll see your bed tonight. Take a look at rip.ie from the very young to the very old. They're being weeded out day in, day out. And it's very sad to see the younger people. When you get to my age, I mean, maybe another eight years to go biblically and I can be taken out but for young people it's very difficult to see that and I've seen people in school parents of kids in school dying and my goodness it would just oh, it's like a stone had landed on you your heart would be heavy for them but you know if they were saved there's hope so many people go to the graves and there is no hope they're going to last eternity, folks. Again, if you're here this morning in that boat, please turn to Jesus. We've looked at his great love. That's his love. He died in Calvary for you and me. And he's coming back to take us to be with him. He's coming back as a judge. It says there it's appointed in the man to die once and after that face judgment. That's the reality of it. It doesn't matter what the world tells you. I know it says somewhere there that people say he's a long time coming. He'll be coming just the same. 
make no mistake of that, it is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to the Lord. Come to Jesus, I ask you. I ask in love and in the love of the Lord God to come to him and be saved. Amen. Mm -hmm. praise you Lord you are indeed watching over your loved ones and we thank you for that Lord God oh Lord 
What a wonderful Saviour we have in Jesus. And Lord, as we have a mug of tea and fellowship together, Lord, we just thank you for that. Again, Lord God, we just ask uh, to bless us, Lord, as we go forth out of here, Lord. We commit the week to you, Lord. We don't know what lays ahead of us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to be in it, to be with us, Lord, to guide us and lead us, Lord, no matter what the circumstance. And again, Lord God, we lift up folks that can't be here with us today, Lord God, through sickness or whatever the reason, Lord God, we just lift our brothers and sisters before you. And again, Lord God, we just thank you for that love of Jesus, Lord, that deep, deep love. And we ask you, Lord God, that we would indeed love one another as we've been told. And we thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Amen.